Welcome, everyone. Um, so, first things first. Today's my birthday. I'm really. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now I really do feel ready to go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so, a few years ago, my inbox flooded with notifications uh, indicating that my Facebook friends had wished me a happy birthday. And I know this gets most people really excited. Uh, I have to admit, I was kind of annoyed. Um, so I logged in and I changed my birthday to a random day in midsummer. I figured, you know what, Facebook doesn't really need to know my birthday anyway. And then, and then six months later, my inbox flooded again. Now at first, I didn't think much of it. You know, my Facebook friends, they don't know my actual birthday. They responded automatically to the prompt, the same way they would if I saw them in person. I said, hey, you know what, it's my birthday. Well, happy birthday. Well, kind of actually like all of you just did. I mean, today's not actually my birthday. <laughs> Sorry, just a little bit of social engineering humor. But don't worry about it, right? You don't know me that well. You don't know my birthday. But two messages I got from close relatives caught my attention that day. My brother, my sister-in-law, we celebrate every year. They know my real birthday. And yet their responses, their automatic responses, really, resembled all the rest. Happy birthday, Brett! Exclamation point. And this raised questions for me. I mean, why didn't they notice the fake birthday notification? Why didn't they stop and think about the veracity of the signal? Is it significant that automation bias trumped their human judgment? I mean, think about it. In your own lives, can you think of a situation in your life where automation bias trumped your human judgment? Ever uh, follow the instructions given by your GPS, even though you have that nagging feeling that you really should stop and think for yourself, <laughs> right? It's kind of like that episode of The Office where Michael Scott drives straight into a lake. Well, the GPS <laughs> told him to. I mean, it's funny to sort of joke about humans behaving like robots until you stop and think about it, and then you realize how pervasive a problem it really might be. This is the topic of re-engineering humanity. Techno-social engineering of humans exists on an unprecedented scale and scope, and it's only growing more pervasive as we embed networked sensors in our public and our private spaces, our devices, our clothing, and even ourselves. It happens quite early, actually, in elementary school. So six years ago, my first grader comes home from school, and he's like, I got picked, I got selected. I was like, that's great, what happened? and he rattles off something about being one of the kids in his gym class that got picked to wear one of these new devices. It's kind of like a Fitbit. They called it an activity watch. And then a day or two later, I get a letter from the school. I read it, and I went ballistic. I couldn't help but wonder about the who, what, where, when, and why with regard to the collection of data about kids. The letter didn't even vaguely suggest that the parents or the kids could opt out or that their informed consent was required. So I read the letter over and over again, and I kept getting stuck on this line. Seriously? Bedtime and bath time surveillance. So I met with people from the PTA. I wrote a letter to the school superintendent. I went to the general counsel's office. I think what caught people's attention most was a line from the letter that I sent in a very lawyerly tone. I have serious concerns that the school district hasn't fully considered the implications of its child surveillance program. <laughs> well, you know, no one had called it that before, and so people, you know, the, the people sort of suddenly realized the creepiness of bath, bath time and bedtime surveillance. So using the word surveillance was an effective means for getting people to stop and think. No one seems to have done so for a variety of reasons. The program is like many being adopted across the country by school districts. It's aimed at a real problem, combating obesity. It's financed in an age of incredibly shrinking budgets, and it's elevated by the promise that accompanies all new technologies. I mean, people trust the school district, and they love new technology. And so after my intervention, very little changed. Apparently, a little informed consent would fix everything. But this only shows why the conventional sort of privacy concerns fall woefully short because the most pernicious aspect of the program was not the 24-7 data collection, nor was it the lack of informed consent. I mean, don't get me wrong, both of those things really matter. 
But the deeper concern I have with the program is the unexamined techno-social engineering of children. No one thought about how the program shapes the beliefs and preferences of an entire generation of children to accept without question or concern a 24-7 bodily surveillance device that reports data to others. Now, in these kinds of situations, we should expect something called creep. In, in computer science, it's called function creep. In surveillance studies, surveillance creep. Now, surveillance creep can take many forms. It can be the gradual expansion of surveillance from one context to another, from the, from the schools to the bus to the home. Or it can be the gradual expansion of the types of data collected in a particular context with more and more sensors. Or it could be the gradual expansion in the uses of data or the third parties with whom data is shared. Or it can be some combination of all of those things. Surveillance creep is usually something you think about happening on the side of those who are doing the surveillance. So you might think of like the NSA or Facebook expanding its surveillance capabilities slowly and subtly. But it also happens on the other side as those who are being surveilled become accustomed to it. As their beliefs and preferences about technology are shaped through their experiences. These school programs normalize an arrangement that occurs outside the educational context too. Right, so insurance companies want their customers to provide self-tracking data so they can more accurately and efficiently set rates. This is what that whole, like, you know, don't mess with my discount thing is really about. The programs are pervasive in the employment sector, whether sold under the guise of wellness programs that probably don't work, or for, for purposes of pursuing productivity. Look, maybe, maybe you don't have kids in school, maybe you're not on Facebook getting notifications, but I'm sure you've clicked the I agree button recently, probably in the last 24 hours. And that's another example of techno-social engineering. So how many contracts, written contracts, have you entered into in your life? Or even in the last month? If I'd asked this question in the, in the distant past, the, the answer provided would be an order, if not orders of magnitude less than the answer you provide today. And yet, here's the weird thing. In the near future, the question won't make sense. Because the idea of distinct, identifiable contracts that one enters into will be at odds with the experience of completely seamless contractual governance. Now, if you're wondering for a second about what that means, good, good, that's the point. Because there's a deep moral and political issue lurking. Freedom of contract requires the correlative freedom from contract. When contracting becomes automatic and ubiquitous in our lives, both disappear. There is no freedom. So have you entered into a contract that you didn't bother reading? Of course you have. We all have. The contracts, and more importantly, the human-computer interface through which they're presented, are designed so that there's no point in reading the fine print much less in stopping and thinking about the legal relationships you're forming or whether the third parties lurking in the background are trustworthy. No, no, it's a simple user experience by design. See it, click it. Perfectly rational, stimulus response. Now look, online contracting is far from the only example of techno-social engineering that leads us to behave like simple machines. Go back to social media, for example. Ever habitually use the superficial expressions promoted by the interfaces? Clicking a like, or a retweet, or a heart button, instead of formulating a more thoughtful response? Again, of course you have, we all have, the platforms are designed, I better yet, optimized, to get users to communicate this way. They profit from a style of communication, which in Orwellian doublespeak, they call engagement. <laughs> now look, the social media platforms aren't fully responsible for our fake news dilemmas, but they play a real role. Platforms are designed to discourage you from critical thinking, deliberation, or just leaving the platform. They're optimized to get you to outsource thinking and to remain always on. Let me give you another example, a very simple one, the geolocation tracking control on your iPhone. Okay, this is what lets apps keep track of everywhere you are, right? So you just go into your general settings, go to privacy, start with geolocation services turned off, 
What do you need to do to turn it on? Boop. You hit a button. That's it. That's all you got to do. And you see that green color? What does that green color tell you? Go. Safe. Now, what do you need to do to turn it off? Oh, yeah, you, you tap a button. Then you get a warning, a bunch of text that itself's a pain to read. Then you got to tap again on the red text to confirm your decision. And what does that red color tell you? Stop. Danger. Don't do it. Go back. Can you see the difference? I call this design trick the asymmetric use of friction, a slippery slide in one direction, but a steep climb in the other. It's no accident. It's deliberate. The unambiguous nudge steers users down the engineered path of least resistance toward always on tracking. Now, this, like many other examples of techno-social engineering, show how it's occurring everywhere in our lives. And so one scenario worth considering very seriously is that the smart tech of our near future will program us to behave automatically, to, to perform and follow scripts supplied by algorithms. Look, I'm not the first, nor will I be the last, to invoke Orwell in dystopian sci-fi. I mean, Black Mirror resonates for a reason. In many science fiction stories, humans unwittingly sow the seeds of their own destruction by madly rushing down a technological path, attracted by the siren's call of efficiency, optimization, perfection, only to learn that too late along the way they've lost something fundamental, their humanity. What if we were rushing down such a path? Would we even know? This is the basic struggle to being human in the 21st century. How do we know when technology is enhancing or diminishing our humanity? To be able to answer that question, you'd have to know what matters about being human. And that turns out to be an incredibly difficult question that's been debated for millennia without resolution. But I want to give you a new and powerful way to think about these questions. It depends upon a radical repurposing of the Turing test. Now, you may recall of Alan Turing from the blockbuster movie The Imitation Game. Back in 1950, he asked whether machines could think. Okay? And so he, used, he proposed an observational test and used humans as a baseline. So the Turing test examines the line between humans and machines. It focuses on the machine side of the line and gives rise to the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics. So you might think of Alexa or IBM's Watson. But I don't care about engineering intelligent machines. I care about humans. So we want to focus on the human side of the line, use machines as a baseline, and evaluate when humans are nudged or engineered to behave in a machine-like fashion. Again, I don't really care whether IBM's Watson or Alexa or any other AI is intelligent. What I am deeply concerned with, and so should all of you, should be deeply concerned with the deployment of supposedly smart tech in our homes, our hospitals, our workplaces, how, how that reconfigures the environments within which we live and affects human behavior and human capabilities. These reverse Turing tests are useful tests empirically, so social scientists can run experiments to determine when and how humans are nudged to behave like machines. I recently ran a version of one on Facebook using fake birthday notifications. <laughs> Seriously. A, a colleague of mine, Catherine Hench and I, we designed a field experiment. It turns out that your weak ties, people who don't know you really well, predictively behave in an automatic fashion. And that gives us a decent baseline with which to evaluate the behavior of your strong ties, people like your mother who do know you pretty well. When your strong ties start to behave like your weak ties with respect to things that matter, like perhaps your birthday, well, maybe that raises a flag. Maybe that should concern us. I mean, and it turns out it's not just my family. Facebook trains people to behave like automatons. These reverse Turing tests are also useful conceptual tools to investigate our humanity. S human beings have special powers. We, we can imagine things that don't exist. We can communicate in, in person, 
at a distance and across time, across generations, about these imagined things. It, this is how we create shared culture, beliefs, commitments, laws, technologies, all of the foundations of cooperation in modern civilization. What matters most is how we exercise these powers to shape our world and ourselves. Perhaps the most important thing we've engineered for ourselves over the past few centuries is the belief, the commitment, that we can be authors of our own lives. That despite the many environmental contingencies that are outside of our control, that shape who we are and what's possible in our lives, we nonetheless have some degree of freedom, some meaningful agency. But I want you to know that that freedom is not inevitable, it is not natural, don't take it for granted. It is contingent, and it can be lost. Each and every day, everyone in this room and out there listening make countless decisions about technology that on their own terms seem perfectly rational and unproblematic. We adopt technology and mindlessly bind ourselves to the terms and conditions offered. We follow scripts written by platform designers. We carry, wear, and attach devices to ourselves and our children, maintaining a connection but increasing our dependence. We outsource thinking of all sorts, planning, navigation, relationship management. I could go on and on and on. It's just so convenient. There just always seems to be an app for that. Each decision incrementally might be cost-benefit justified. And yet the net effect on who we are and the lives we're capable of leading may be unjustifiable. We need to fight for our freedom to be off, to actively determine our own lives and futures. Nothing less than our humanity is at stake. Thank you.